Hello and welcome in today's exciting episode. Actually, it's part one of me making this jacket because I kind of got stuck with the embellishment. It's perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect jacket. A third of the month is already over and I only have one um, dress made. Well, I actually have a, um, the black and white one done too and I've got that the bodice for the um, pleating video, the bodice is made, so half that dress is made. But uh, yeah, I decided to, I was going to stop and do the rest of that dress and make that video, but I thought, no, I'll do this. I know, I've sort of already done a jacket this month because the khaki one, I extended August by an episode and I did the khaki jacket. But uh, yeah, I thought I'd just keep going with this one. So I'm doing the embellishment. I'll show you the first half of me making this. And then this is how it ends. So I'm doing this voiceover after I've taken a break. I've just finished doing this work on the back. But now I'll skip back in time and show you. Yeah, I basically cut up the fabric, then remembered to turn on the camera. So it's all happening at the moment. Yeah. Anyway. Here is the first half of me making this jacket and then I'll pop on again at the end. So this is the fabric that I'm using to make the jacket this episode. Well, these are the scraps of it. Not very much left out of one yard. I um, It took me ages to place the bits because there was just zero room for error. Anyway, I cut out two fronts, two backs and um, two facing bits and, or the inside front of the um, lining and these are the bits that I cut it out of so that yeah I only just had enough to cut them out it was yeah ridiculous how yeah there was zero waste at some points Obviously, there's a tiny bit of waste, but yeah. Anyway, finally cut out all the pieces. I've pinned the structural layer, so the net, stiff net um, fabric, to the back of the tweed. And now these are the two back pieces, back left, back right. And the next first thing I'm going to do is machine sew them together. So I'll just pin them together as, um, yeah, I sort of pretty much got them flush with the um with the pattern matching but yeah I really did not have very much fabric anyway so I pinned the machine sewed them now the back is one big bit and then I hand stitched down the seam allowance so now it is time to turn this whole thing over but before I can do that I have to um, take the pins out of the back here and put them in the side so I can turn the whole piece over. This is going to be fun. I'll just take one pin out at a time and pin the all the layers together at the side. It, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting because I have to sew the backing fabric to the tweed. But yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to do it from the other side so I can bead it at the same time. So yeah, I've done half of it and now I've just got this little bit here to go. Here we go. So now I am turning it over and this is the, it's the back piece, but it's the outer jacket and they're not too badly matched. As I said, I had really very, very small amount of fabric. I had one yard. I think I should have bought well gone back in time and bought a yard and a half but yeah what can you do anyway now it is time to sew the layers together and embellish at the same time I do have these blue beads and I think they're good because I don't know they remind me of raindrops you know in cartoons how they sort of have that tear shape anyway I thought these might be nice because the tweed is navy blue and orange I actually have some orange beads as well so maybe I should mix them oh maybe I'll start with the blue oh, I, I went and got some orange so now I'm thinking that the orange is maybe a better idea it looks really orange look really good so I think I will probably start with the orange because I yeah 
I can always use navy up because I have so many tweeds with navy in them. Whereas orange and burnt orange, um, yeah, I don't really have that many tweeds with those colours in them. So here I'm just going along and embellishing it. I decided to sort of do it on the lines and then I'll go back later and bulk it up a bit. But at the moment I'm just sort of trying it out, seeing if I like it. I like it well enough, so I will keep going and yeah, I will do some more and then I will be back. Those leaf shape sequins there, they're vintage sequins. That's why they're a little bit gnarly, but I'm still using them because they're vintage. So here we are. I've done a little more and it's very slow going, but I quite like it. Yeah, so um, at this point, I still, I wasn't sure whether I was going to the two pins that I've got there I was like maybe I'll do lots of straight lines but then yeah I sort of changed my mind later but I decided to just do the edge of each sort of check first and then once I've established that then um, maybe fill in and so now I'm doing the horizontal just yeah just to get better purchase between the two fabrics and then I'll go back and fill in the rest and yeah, um, it's looking good. It's, it's very sparse. At this point, I was like, instead of doing lots of straight grid lines up and down and across, maybe I'll do the Dior thing where you've got, you know, up and down lines, across lines, and then diagonal both ways. But then I put the pins in in diagonals and the diagonals are slightly off. They're not like 45 degrees. They're slightly off because it's a weave, not a point to point. So, and also this centre panel, because it's two halves sewn together, they're not a full square, a full check. So that would be problematic as well. So now I'm thinking I'll just continue with these initial lines. Then once I've done the initial lines, I'll beef them up with some navy blue and more orange. So that's my current thinking. So now I just have to do all of that so yeah I just oh and this is I'd st finished the um that first line so I decided to stop and show you just how far I've come along and I've finished the second one as well almost and this is so I used up that initial one string of seed beads and one string of micro beads and a sequence so it's time to cut another one and yeah dump that out and use that but I actually have all these micro beads so I yeah before I cut more of those standard size beads I decided to get out a micro beading needle and use up some of these micro beads I yeah I wouldn't normally the micro beads are actually much more expensive and they're much more difficult to use and you can't even see them anyway but I'm on a mission to use up absolutely all of my beads so I figure now's as good as time as any so I yeah got out my beading needle so the really thin ones and I decided to bead them just to sort of beef up one of the lines and see what that looked like so I went and did that now this micro beading really is an anticlimax. It's not, um, well, none of it's really over the top or very big. But yeah, this is particularly <laughs> subtle and small. They are beautiful beads. I'm just not sure. <laughs> My shoulder blades are the best place for them. This is the top of the back. So yeah, I'll, um, what? Once the big blue ones are on and more of the orange ones, it's going to look amazing, but it is so average now. It is very mediocre, but yeah, so I went along there and then there was a little bit of thread left, so I did a little bit down as well. It took forever. It's not the greatest use of time, but I don't know. You have to do a little micro beading every now and again because it's just, it takes so much skill and it's it's beautiful in its own very very subtle way 
Anyway, so now that I've cleared the um, tray of most of the microbeads, it's time to tip out, um, cut another strand of the regular size seed beads, as well as some more sequins. And I'm also going to get more of those little skull shaped ones. And I'm just going to keep going with this. It's looking pretty good. I mean, it's, it's bare bones at the moment, but once I bulk it up, it's going to look good, I think. So here we go. I tipped, I cut a lot of more, a lot more seed beads and the sequins. And that's, there's a whole packet of those little skulls, but that whole packet has to last all the back and all the front. Normally when I'm beading, I sort of work out quadrants and then, yeah, sort of divide all the beads that I have into four little boxes and only use the you know, the quarter of the whole mass of beads for that particular part. I might do that. I'll lay down the initial groundwork first and then work out what I have left. So then I had to stop work on this jacket and go and film the everything I made in August video. I had hoped to have this orange and navy blue jacket ready, but, oh, and this is, this dress it just looks so good. I absolutely love it. I want to try it with an orange tie sash. I think that would look gorgeous. And of course, my Chanel. Ooh, I have some leftover of those oil slick beads. But I don't know, be using the same beads for two jackets in a row is a little bit. I try never to do that. Anyway, I am now back at this and I've got some different blue beads and I've got blue sequ navy blue sequins as well. So I will go along and finish the grid work, this initial layer along all the edges of the checks, and then I will be back. Spoiler alert, I changed my mind. Okay, so this is the next day. And yeah, after I sort of I was done for the night, I was like, mm, it's okay, but I really wanted to use the big... Um, they're not heavy. Some of them, are the large flat ones, because they're flat, the weight is safe and they're made out of plastic. They're just painted plastic. So they're quite light as well and they won't um, get caught on anything. So I was like, well, maybe I'll use them. I, I don't know why I buy half the beads that I buy, but they just seem really perfect for this. So I was like, hmm, will I do it? So I decided that I'll leave the back as it is and I'll just make the front up. So before I could do the front, I had to sew the the lining pieces on to the, um, so this is the front left and the front right. And so I pinned the, um, this is the lining bit, but the tweed bit. I have to pin that on a machine, sew it on now so that when I do the embellishment on the front, like I won't be able to get it under the sewing machine later. So I have to do this bit of sewing machine, um, sewing machine work now. So I sewed them on and then I pinned back the seam allowance. And then obviously now I just have to hand stitch that. And because the tweed bit that's going to be part of the lining, essentially like a facing, um, yeah, because that's not going to have any beads on it, I also have to hand stitch that tweed to the backing fabric. So yeah, so now you can see the one on the left is just still pinned and the one on the right, I've done all the hand sewing. So a lot of people will tell me like, what's the point of the hand sewing? You can't even see it. That is the point. You can see it on the back, but it just holds everything perfectly in place. If you used a sewing machine, you could see it and it would warp. The I just love the nature of wools and tweeds and using a sewing machine on them for anything other than the long seams. I just think it destroys the nature of the fabric that you're using, so I wouldn't do it. Anyway, each their own. Those two front panels of the lining are in now, so I can bead the whole front of the jacket without having to, you know, worry about, can I put a bead here or is it the seam allowance for the, um, you know, the center front? 
Anyway, so then I started using the larger beads and I like this. I like this so much more than I like the um, the previous work I was doing on the, the test, the sample bit on the back. So this is what it's going to be like now. At this point, I was like, oh, I could probably just sew over, you know, embellish over what I've already done on the back. But yeah, no, I'm going to unpick it eventually. But yeah, this is, I really like, it's not, um, it doesn't look good. I'm not saying that, but it's a really good base. So um, when you're applying beads to something that you're actually going to wear, like it's going to be constantly in movement, that's part of the, like what the finished piece is going to be, then it has to be applied safely. So you've got to do, instead of applying all the beads at once, you apply three or five lines of beads all in in the same area, like I'm going to have rows of beads and it's just going to look like one row of beads, but it's going to be five, actually five rows of beads. And that way it's kind of like, instead of just having one big root, a tree has like hundreds of roots. So if you look at this on the back, well, I'm using black thread, so I will turn it over later, but you can't really see. But um, yeah, if you turned it over, it would look like um, the threads were kind of all these different hundreds of roots rather than just one big chunky string like with all a ridiculous amount of weight on it. It's just lots of bits with a little bit of weight on each. And because the weight is dispersed so evenly, so sometimes my design aesthetic, like from the front, might not make sense. But if you think about how heavy a bead is and all the beads surrounding it, then you sort of go, oh, okay, she chose to do this motif in this particular bit because, probably because of, for weight reasons, so that the whole pieces a whole will age well. Anyway, so now I'm deciding how much of the back I have to unpick. At this point, I was like, well, maybe I'll unpick everything but those two center lines. And I was going to do like a spine, a thick spine, and then just have the thinner ones around it. So I unpicked most of the back, but I was still, because I mean, when you bead something or embellish something, you just put so much work into it. And I'm always a little reluctant to unpick something. Also, I bead the proper way, like each bead is attached once and then attached again. So it's very firmly stuck there. <laughs> so undoing each bead, you actually have to cut the threads, like find the threads, isolate them so you don't get anything else, cut the threads for every single bead. It, it just takes so long. I mean, it takes a lot less time to take it out than it did to do it, obviously. But yeah, so it ended up taking everything out and here I am attaching the bigger beads to the back. And I'm, I'm much happier with this. I should have done this from the start, but yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, oh, we should be more grown up. But then when I do the beading, like I would want the beading done, I'm just so much happier. So I don't know. This is me showing you the back. There's actually three rows of the foundational beading but the thread is black, so I'm not sure if you can see. My stitches are very neat. I worked in embroidery for a long time before I started beading. So yeah, the um, it's really important if you want to be good at embroidery or beading that your back is cleaner than the front. And yeah, it just means that you can be as ambitious as you want. Whereas if you're messy, you'll only ever get so far. But... I do, I do sometimes try to do a less extra version of something, but I just end up being me. What could I say? It's It's got to be something I'm going to wear, otherwise it's kind of like a waste of resources. Anyway, I shall continue beading. Okay, I just add edited and narrated that first whole section, and I realised I didn't show you a finished shot of the front. So this is the front left and front right. Um, I've just done the foundational layer of the beading, but yeah, it's um, up to scratch. It's doing pretty well. So this is the whole of the front, 
and there is a little bit on the left side so right side of the screen that um, there's a couple of beads there that haven't been done and this is the whole of the back so I went and did the foundational layer and then as you can see I also started the next layers so um, yeah I started at the bottom in the bottom right hand corner and yeah but I did the finish the foundational layer first so all that thread I think about it from the back so all that thread is the bottom layer of thread so that's going to be the biggest beads are going to have their threads most secure so now I'm going over and doing the medium sized beads and then yeah sort of again I'm doing them in layers and then once that's done I'll do the smallest beads so yeah eventually the threads that carry the smallest beads will be on the outside and it will sort of hug together everything underneath it so that's the safest way to do it and it will protect everything over the long term but also the beads look quite cute the way they are so the second layer of beads that i'm working on are the medium ones so it's safest to work on big beads medium beads smaller beads and um, yeah, I was just trying to get it done faster. So that's originally why I was doing it in the wrong order. But um, yeah, it didn't work for me. I should just do what I do. So these are the beads that I'm using now. And I, I prefer the, um, the design to look organic. So that's why there's a little cluster of orange round ones, then the pick up sticks ones. And yeah, I just like working this way. But also I have a truly massive um bead collection that i'm trying to use up so this does use a lot of beads and you have to have a lot of beads to choose from to pick ones that will work together well so i mean it's problematic that way <laughs> unless it, i mean you can just go to a bead store and pick everything and i don't know i feel like that's more expensive when you buy beads like one or two packets at a time you don't feel the expense but you do end up with a massive collection so that's the way i did it the organic way but obviously it does take a decade or two of your life so you know um there's all different approaches <laughs> are valid but yeah, so I'm just going to go along and keep beading. And I will be back once I've done the whole of the back half of the jacket. I did keep divide the medium sized beads into two little boxes. This is just the beads. This is just half of them. So this is for the back. And obviously I'm going to keep some because once I've sewn the front and the back together of the jacket, then I have to do some more work to the seams. And then I'll have to bead around the edges that I had to leave vacant so that I could machine sew. But um, yeah, so I'll use almost all these beads on the back, but I have to keep some back. And once I've done that, I shall be back. Wish me luck. This is going to take forever. But this is the fun part. All the like boring foundational layer is done and I get to do sprinkle all the you know the cute bits in so i've done half of the back so i just thought i'd check in and well pick up the camera remember to pick up the camera and take photos so this half is done it's the left but yeah i'm working on it upside down i just find it easier when i'm doing the bottom half to have that closest to me when i'm working on the top half to sort of turn it all around and have that closest to me that way i'm not reaching over too much and you can because you really have to pull the thread out at direct like straight up and if it's too if you have to reach too far across the table it's yeah it's a little too awkward to do that now i could have stopped at this point and worked on the dress and finished the pleating episode but it was like the last episode was everything i made last month and the episode before that was a dress one. So I didn't want to have two dress ones too close to each other because they're kind of the same dresses constructed the same way. So I thought I might as well just... And I've already got over 20 minutes of the edited, fully made episode of this one done. So I thought I'll just 
split this into two episodes because I've also been getting other YouTubers, um, I saw a YouTubers say, why do you put so much content, so much work in each episode? Why don't you break it up? It just, you know, you're making other people look bad. Well, it's only, there's only a couple who are a little negative. Most people are incredibly supportive and I really, I so appreciate the support. Thank you so much. But it did make me question how much <laughs> you know, how many hours of work I put into each episode. So yeah, I I decided that I'd just keep going with this and maybe break it up into two episodes. So yeah. And if you do have any questions about this half, let me know in the comments section and I'll answer them in the second half or sort of go into more detail about a particular um, technique or part of making this jacket in the second part of this. Anyway, so yeah, these are a couple of stills and I just decided to keep working on this jacket because it would have taken me a couple of hours to finish the dress or I could spend that time just finishing the back of this. And I don't know, I'm just really happy that I decided to unpick what I'd done and just, yeah, it wasn't the right investment of time and I'm glad I went, no, nope, wrong investment, cut it off, do something better or something different, which as it turns out was better. So yeah, I'm just looking at the back spine, the center back here. It's um when I originally made this jacket, I assumed I was going to bead over the spine. So I just literally, it took me a few seconds to do that hand stitch the seam allowance down and you can tell it only took me a few seconds. But I don't think I'll undo it and redo it because and redo it neatly because what I love about my work is that you can tell one person did everything. I mean, the three jackets that I make are heavily influenced by Paris fashion houses and, you know, the work, the couture work, the really, really high end work that they produce that has Lesage embroidery on it. But those things, uh, those pieces uh, sort of designed by whoever the creative director happens to be at the time and then the pattern drafter make drafts the actual pattern and then um, the the creative director's assistant talks to Lesage and they come up with a you know a practical design for what the creative director was thinking about for you know, the beading and the embroidery that's going to go on the piece. So then a mock-up's done back at the house and once they're happy with that, then those pieces get cut out and they get sent over to the embroider, the embellishers. And then the people who worked on and designed, you know, created the design just did the paper pattern for the beading and then the people in the workroom who know how to bead actually do the beading and depending on how much time they have, a lot of people can be working on one garment or all the pieces for one garment. So there has to be a sort of conformity and a uniformity to the way they're made. And then all those pieces eventually go back to the fashion house where the experts in seam, you know, seamstresses create the actual garment. So, yeah, I don't know. I really quite like the faults and imperfections in mind because you can tell this is one person thought up the idea and constructed all elements of it and I just think that's amazing that I mean I'm certainly not the best at anything but I yeah I'm not sure there are terribly many people who can do all those things to this degree so yeah I'm quite proud of the some some aspects are a little scrappy, but I like that about it. It's very, yeah, it tells the story of who made this and how it was created. And I think that's amazing. This is me showing you how many beads there are on this piece. So these are just the medium sized beads, obviously not the large ones. But a lot of you will always want to know what how many beads there are. And these are all different beads bought over a decade or two decades. So I can't tell you prices. I don't think it's good when you're beading to fixate on cost because it's not worth it. It's so completely not worth it. 
you could never sell any embellished work because it's just there's just too many hours and too the materials are just far too costly but it's beautiful and you improve your technique every time you make something even if you make a mistake and have to unpick it and redo it you know I'm a better beater for the mistakes I've made and how I've learned to move past them Anyway, that is it for this episode. I have finished the back. I still have the front to do. But yeah, I'm really happy with this. I don't know that I'll go along and put in another layer. I'll do the front first. And once I finish that, I'll decide whether, you know, there's a limit to how much time I have. But also, I don't want to weigh it down too much. I'm already going to have to reinforce those shoulder seams, which is going to be fun and interesting. Well, it'll be interesting for you. It'll be a nightmare for me who's actually doing it. I mean, it's a different technique. So that's why it's interesting. And I've already decided which um, changes I'm going to make to the next version of this jacket. Okay, so speaking of next, the next video you will see will be the pleating one. And then meanwhile, yeah, because it's going to take me more than two days to finish this for shawzies. Anyway, so yeah, I still have all those beads to do for the front one. That's what I'll be doing after I do the pleated dress. And yeah. Oh, and the big pearl tip pins at the bottom of each piece of the jacket. Um, they mark the hemline and the cuff lines. I can't remember whether I went back and changed that, re-edited it. Anyway, I'll just mention it again, just in case. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've been inspired to do some beating of your own or been warned off it. <laughs> It does take a lot of time, a lot of time, but I think it's worth it. Anyway, happy sewing.